like the images were very strong. Like they put up all these signs, like how it could be. So this is what you see here. So it's a it's a very low key project, low key measures, but it does work of finding the balance in a mobility donut. And also again, uh, taking those people with you, like showing them how it could be. And this is from the same project, like here could be the future sidewalk, communicating to people passing by that there will be other options soon. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Babette Hendricks from Mobicon in the Netherlands. We're gonna be talking about the Mobility Donut, which is a theoretical construct uh, that Mobicon has been working on for several years now. Uh, and I am delighted to share this with you. Uh, it is related to the economic theory, uh, the donut theory of economics, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, also will provide uh, links for that construct as well in the show notes and in the video description below. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right to it that. Well, Beth, Beth, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> but Beth, I always like to uh, give my guests just a moment to uh, introduce themselves. So uh, who are you and what is it you do? <laughs> Well, uh, I'm Babette Hendricks. I am a consultant at Mobicon, which is a Dutch, originally Dutch consultancy working on sustainable mobility. Uh, we try to make the world less dependent of the cars. Uh, we are also working in the US, Canada, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, my home base is, is, uh, is the Netherlands. That's where I'm sitting right now. And I'm often engaged in uh, mobility planning. Uh, so really on a policy level, not so much on uh, designing streets or places, uh, but very much on this mobility plan policy level. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Now, when you say policy level, what do you re really mean by that? Um, yeah, so before we can make decisions on how we want to design our uh, places, our streets, we have to have made some choices with, you know, in a local government, they need some choices on paper. What what do we want to prioritize? Who do we want to prioritize? What kind of neighborhoods do we want to live in? Um, and I support local governments, ma mainly in the Netherlands, with making those decisions. Right, right. Okay. And you, you said you're, you're there in the Nether Netherlands at, at this point in time. Um, the offices are there in Delft, right? Uh, yeah, well, the main office in the Netherlands is in Delft, okay. uh, but I'm calling in from Zwolle right now. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, and we have an office in Den Bosch. Not sure if you know that. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. I live in Nijmegen, and you definitely know that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's that's quite a trip from Nijmegen to Zwolle. It's an hour train, yeah. so it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and we're going to be talking about mobility, and, and that's an example of mobility and, and everything. Now, you and I met at uh, the Velocity Conference in Leipzig, Germany, and you gave a presentation about uh, what Mobicon is calling the mobility donut. And uh, so that's what we're going to dive into. Um, real briefly, as we, we pop on over to uh, this, this title slide here, um, why the mobility donut? What, how, how, how is it that, that we came to this? Well, uh, it's it's quite a story. <laughs> We've been working <laughs> on it for a couple of years now. Yeah. Um, so, well, as I said, we are working on mobility planning, so the policy. And several colleagues were working on mobility poverty. Several colleagues were working on public transport and uh, ensuring a sort of basic level of mobility. And we were discussing, like, is there one frame or one story that we can tell that uh, holds all these concepts. And while we were talking, uh, we thought of the donut economy and we in, like in an instant, we saw the parallel to a mobility donut. And um, because what the donut economy really uh, shows is how we have to move away from like a linear economy uh, focusing on growth to a circular economy uh, that is well closed in a sense that we just have like a two levels that we have to move between uh, in between uh, and not focus on growth 
and that is, you know, how we also found an, a comparison to the mobility donut. Yeah. And sticking here on the, the, the mobile or the uh, economic donut model, uh, that's an entire philo- philosophic uh, framework. And we could spend an entire hour just talking about this. But um, I did want to pull up the uh, Donut Economic Action Lab website. And so if people want to really dive in deep and understand more about what, what the concepts are here, but really it's it, it is this sort of different way way of thinking about a compass to human prosperity uh, in the 21st century. And, 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 and the key thing that I notice about when we, when we, we talk about, you know, these concept, it's like you, this concept of running up against uh, the planetary boundaries that exist. And so that's one of the, the things that really resonates with this model because we can kind of see that, you know, it's not a good thing when you have a shortfall of resources, whether it's food or water or your political voice, uh, peace and justice. If you have a shortfall of thing, those things, it's bad. <laughs> And, and really what we see is that, we're, that this concept is that, you know, there's this area in the middle, this donut, uh, you know, between, uh, you know, the, the, the shortfall and the overshoot, because when we have an overshoot of certain things, then we start to see the, the bad things that start to happen, the ocean acidification, the biodiversity loss, things of that. So I just wanted to you know, frame that a little bit. Is there anything that I'm missing from this concept of, you know, the, this paradigm, this different way of thinking that, that is relevant before we go back to your presentation? Um, well, I'll touch upon it later, but what you see here is, you know, in the donut framework, um, you'll see all these different slices. Uh, um, and we've, done a, we've made a like a, a proposal for how we think the mobility donut slices should work uh, uh, okay, but that's cool. a very complex uh, discussion but so we can talk about it but it's it changes throughout our experience like throughout the months and years working on it but it also changes depending on who I talk to <laughs> but uh, so that's a f- aspect and what I find very important is what you already said is like the ceiling, the, you know, what is what is the boundaries of our uh, economy and how we translate that to mobility. I think that's very powerful. And uh, for some decision makers, it will be frightening. <laughs> but we find it very powerful to bring that into the picture. Yeah. So we we referenced uh, earlier, you know, your trip, you know, from where you're, you're living in Naiving and up to Zawala. And, uh, and I made the comment about mobility and, uh, you know, the very first image that you have in your presentation is, is an image. It looks like the Jonathan Moss from Portland, uh, is credited with this particular photo. Hey, th- this looks like mobility too. Yeah, this looks like mobility too. It is, it is. I, when preparing for the podcast, I try to collect, you know, photos that, captured the donut all in once and I think this picture does uh, you see the physical space that is given to car drivers who well I assume that they are able to go anywhere everywhere anytime with their car and then we see a lack of a proper pathway for the guy here in the middle of the photo and you know, it's, it shows to me how we have prioritized in our mobility planning for over decades and how we now have like shortfalls in the inside of the donut, but I'll, under, I'll illustrate that later, but it captures everything. Yeah, it, well, it captures for me what an auto sewer <laughs> this is, <laughs> it captures for me exactly what you said we prioritize the movement the mobility of one mode of of transport one mode of mobility ver- and to the the detriment of of others yes this person is able to walk but it's certainly not a welcoming or inviting place to walk theoretically one is able to ride a bike 
here, but it's certainly not a welcoming or safe, uh, inviting place to do so. We, we then have, have this image, and, and this is a fabulous image too, because we, I can see the layers of mobility options here. Talk about this. That's what I wanted to show as well. Like here you already see how uh, space is somewhat, it's better divided amongst all the uh, modes of transport. So what I, I found interesting is that I think that I'm looking to, I'm not super sure, uh, but I think I'm looking to a bus lane even. So I'm not sure if it is uh, open for cars, but it shows how the balance moves towards active mobility to public transport, creating options for a variety of people and not, you know, uh, how do you say, making, I lost the English word, <laughs> uh, but making it obligatory to drive a car. Right. Yeah. 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 So you have the freedom to choose like what you, what you want to do. And see, I was searching my mind for the Dutch word for that and I couldn't think of it either. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, and then we go to this, wait a minute. Yeah. How, where did, where does this fit in with that and that? Well, I wanted to show different places in the city where you can apply the donut frame um, and where, you know, all the places in the city or towns where you have to every time prioritize. And also in Dutch towns, uh, we do see a lot of streets uh, focusing on parking and car parking. And this one obviously is transformed to an area to play and to meet each other and to uh, get back some green in the street and you know that's a way where we or that's a that's a future <laughs> that i foresee for so many streets yeah and th so this looks like it's uh, again could probably in a previous iteration of this photo probably had car parking in this area maybe even automobility through this area it's been transformed into what looks like to be a living street a play street uh uh, a, a Vonerf, is is that what we're looking at? Would you call that a Vonerf? Um, we could call this a Vonerf, but mm -hmm. Vonerf still have uh, access for cars. Oh, and that's I right, because it is more of a shared space. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is not a shared space anymore, although we do see it's the bicycles in uh, parked back. in the background yeah. there. So it is a shared mobility space from uh, a cycling. You can ride your bike through here and we see uh, the kids uh, trike there, um, you know, next to the playground. So uh, fantastic. OK, so it is a shared space from the standpoint of people walking, biking, kids playing, uh, things of that nature. But this is more of a living space. This is a flow to versus more of a flow through from a mobility perspective. Right. But I that's why I included the previous picture and this one, because at both places we can think of like what kind of living environment do we want to live in uh, and what is the place, what is the function of this place in the bigger picture um, and what kind of balance, mobility donut balance do we strive for? Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Okay. Fantastic. Now we're, now we're back to the donut and we've been talking about donuts so, so often I'm starting to, to get a little hungry. I'm going to take a sip of coffee here. So we're, we're here at the, at the, at the donut framework and we see the Mobicon colors here. Uh, Let's take it to this next level of the mobility poverty. Walk us through this. Yeah. So can you can you pull it back one slide? Because so back I to just, here, the donut. Yeah. Yeah. To the donut, because I forgot something in my introduction that I want to mention. OK. Another reason why we came up with the mobility donut and mm -hmm. why it proves that it's important to use this frame and start talking about this frame is that we've been measuring our mobility systems, the performance of our mobility system on a words like free flow or traffic jams, right? Um, and I do wanna emphasize that this framework helps us to move towards like we wanna assess our mobility don of uh, our mobility systems based on well-being. So that's also a, a big reason, a major reason why we start using the donut. 
and talk about the donut. Because, you know, that's also in the, um, uh, when you read about the, mo- the donut economy uh, on the website that you shared earlier, you'll find uh, words like well-being as well. I think that's interesting talking about the donut, like the shift from measuring our mobility system on uh, free flow or traffic jams or whatever to like how happy are people using this mobility system in this world? Uh, are they able to get where they want to? Yeah. And, and I guess one could argue that, uh, you know, here seems like this is a pretty happy place, but from an auto mobility perspective, there's some restrictions to this. So the access has been controlled for, for that particular mode of mobility. Um, so there's that balance that we're trying to strive for. Okay. Right. So that's where, that's another major reason where, where we came from in the shift, because there is this big transformation going on, right. In our, in our field of work that we don't talk about, anymore about traffic jams, about free flow and stuff, and more and more about well-being. We need new narratives to work with our decision makers, to work with people, <laughs> with citizens. Um, and that's where the donut frame comes in. And that's also a way to put forward the concept of mobility poverty. Because mobility poverty up to like four or five years ago wasn't much in the center of discussion and we are still trying to figure out how to show our decision makers that mobility poverty is a a real thing so the donut economy also because it talks it it focuses more on the well-being of our uh, cities it also is a tool to uh, talk about mobility poverty and relate mobility poverty to excessive mobility yeah so with that context in mind of bringing wellness into uh, there, and I would also use the term human vitality uh, as, as a, an analogous uh, phrase to, to wellness, um, what about economics and what about economic vitality and economic wellness? Is that also considered at this point when we're starting to, to talk about mobility, happiness, and mobili- basic mobility and, uh, and, and mobility poverty? Yeah, so that very much is related. So, you know, talking about the Netherlands, a lot of research institutes are figuring out a way of how to transform uh, the discussions around our mobility system, uh, which is based on, you know, old fashioned economics of growth, based on growth, uh, trying to shift that discussion to well-being, which means that we have to think about does it influence us right now, right here, but also does it influence or impact future generations? So, yeah, so, you know, economy, uh, as which is, of course, a huge word, but economy is very much related to this. Because the reason why I bring the reason why I bring that up is, you know, since we do have an international audience uh, to the podcast here, you know, some cynics might be like, well, this is all fun and and dandy and and livability and play. But what about economics? What about, you know, the business that's right down on the corner there and and they're complaining that this is is negatively impacting them? So it sounds like we have to sort of also sort of layer in a, a variety of different stakeholders, a variety of different metrics and measurements when coming to uh, this. So it's not just wellness, it's not just human vitality, but it's also this layer uh, because if, it, if the economy, quote unquote, is destroyed, then I guess that doesn't really help human vitality. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so... The discussion of the mobility donut is part of this much bigger discussion of how to address our economy and how to talk about our economy and talk about the performance of our economy. Like what kind of numbers or words would you use for the performance of our economy? That discussion is going on worldwide. Uh, The mobility donut has a place in that bigger discussion. Using the mobility donut uh, to me, again, is a framework that uh, enables to talk and relate to all kinds of disciplines of, of um, working fields 
rather than talking about the old fashioned, like uh, how we used to make mobility plans and talking about free flow, limited people relate to a concept of free flow. If we can talk about what kind of city we want to live in. Right. And, and that brings us to excessive mobility and this, the, you know, this 80 year old fascination uh, that many car centric communities have had with, uh, with trying to reach uh, an LOS level of free flowing traffic of motor vehicle traffic. And, and to your point, we're starting to realize, well, wait a minute, maybe we were measuring the wrong thing. You know, maybe LOS shouldn't stand for level of service. Maybe it should stand for something more holistic and tied to uh, mobility, happiness uh, and, and vitality and economic vitality. Maybe LOS should stand for level of safety or level of satisfaction or something else. Is that kind of what you're talking about when, when we look at that excessive mobility? Yeah, that's one thing. So we've, you, you want to shift the story and make sure that we talk about that there is a boundary. <laughs> that's the first purpose. And then excessive mobility, when there is excessive mobility, of course, the consequences of that, um, I didn't put it in this frame uh, because we can talk about hours again for like only what should be on the outside of the donut. And it's super complex uh, because it's very technical and you can have discussions on how to measure stuff. Uh, but of course, words that you will find on the outside of, of the donut is pollution. It's to, how do you say, a lack of space that some modes take up too much space. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it brings us back to our very first photo here is where we have, you know, an excessive amount of mobility for one mode. And yeah, some of the negative externalities of this include pollution, include uh, traffic fatalities, include uh, noise. Uh, and suddenly, oh yeah, these negative externalities are actually compromising health and well-being and economic vitality and all of these things that we would like to have for a prosperous society. Right. Yeah. So, so that's what we talk about when we address excessive mobility. Yeah. Yeah. And this brings us back to our foundation of where we are at with the, uh, with where all of this came from. So yeah, when we zoom in and we take a look at, uh, at some of the things that we're looking at as we're going to the exterior, uh, you know, in, in the, what we're calling excessive mobility, using the framework of the, um, the economic donut, we're seeing that, oh yeah, some of those same things that we just said, we just talked about pollution and fatalities and injuries. Oh yeah, these are the kinds of things that we're seeing here too. Right. Yeah, so we've uh, been inspired by those words and then for mobility poverty because we... Uh, didn't really focus on that or explain it, but we would use some other words, of course, than what is uh, put in here for the donut yeah, economy. Yeah, because yeah, when you um, zoom in, you see uh, you have to have a little, little different context, a little bit different words. That, yeah, yeah. And what is important there is that a long time mobility poverty was thought of as you know there's no public transport. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's it, full stop. But no, uh, mobility poverty is, someone experiences mobility poverty when the person cannot get to uh, an activity somewhere in town and thus cannot be fully part of society. Yeah, it's, it's what I would call lack of access to. Yeah, right. So, and the factors causing that, uh, so uh, some... So if you can pay it, so your financial uh, situation, if you understand how to ride a bike, if you understand how to book your trip. So all these kind of skills th that you need. And of course, the infrastructure should be there. Yeah, uh, because when so we go back to this this shot, the infrastructure should be there because when we zoom in on, on that person and we see, oh, we pull back out and it's like, oh yeah, she's experiencing some mobility 
access issues. And so this is a mobility poverty situation for her particular mode. If she happens to have the privilege of, of owning a motor vehicle, maybe she's super fine with, with the way this yeah. is designed. Right. So these words would then be inside the uh, mobility donut that I just mentioned. Well, you didn't ask me the big question yet of how we define these boundaries, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's. We've been, ha- we've been having fun defining what mobility is, but yes, go, let, shall, shall we, uh, shall we dive in? And the next slide uh, in your presentation is, is, is this, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is not entirely about uh, the boundaries that I was talking uh, or referring to, to but um, back to like why we use the donut. Uh, and what is helpful in using the donut. Uh, we've been talking about Velo City in several s- sessions. There was a discussion of changing the narrative. And to me, you know, what I said earlier, the, the mobility donut is a very helpful tool to change the narrative because we've been doing a lot of work in the past trying to discuss with people who are opposed to, you know, more active mobility, that we do need more active mobility and mobility. And it was like a discussion us against them and the mobility donut, because it zooms out, it, it let us, it lets us ask like, what kind of living environment do we want to live in? What is the world that makes you happy? You can, you can have another discussion. So that's helpful talking to citizens. And this is a game that we designed uh, that we use with citizens, but mostly with professional stakeholders, people working in a municipality, for example. And we fictively, like, we play a game that they have to come up with a mobility plan. So they have to discuss with each other in what kind of uh, measures do we want to invest. Everyone has his or her own purpose or, or task within the game and they have to discuss in the end they have like this package of measures and we've uh, made a score for every measure on the donut so that whenever the game is finished there will be like a spider web of scores and then they will see like ah we invested our money in stuff that uh, focus a lot on excessive mobility so you know talk it will not be that good for the city because of what pollution and all the climate uh, dis- big discussions, for example, or we just we put in too le- too few money in in the inside, so there are still groups of people that cannot move around or do not have the freedom to uh, move through the city. The interesting thing here is that we play it with people from several fields of work, so not entirely a mobility group of people, and. They, they realize what their role is in the mobility plan. They, now, they understand better how mobility contributes to their field of work. People working on health, for example, they very much need a mobility plan that focuses on active mobility. Or people working on economy, they need a mobility plan that enables uh, uh, tr- uh, people to get to work but also that uh, their town is still vital and people visit town, for example. So that's super interesting. And we bring it all together in one. Yeah. Wow. So this is cool. So I can see this being sort of like a monopoly game is a a nice board. Uh, Hey, game night. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's the fun thing as well, right? Because, you know, uh, oftentimes people don't know each other. And we have to introduce colleagues to each other. So, you know, that's that's an extra to playing this game. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so walk us through uh, the different uh, segments here. I see a, a, a dice at the end of each of the accesses here. Uh, so walk us through uh, what happens. Do we Are we rolling the dice when we're at the dice? Yeah, we're rolling the dice when we're at the dice. Um, and they can get to like the orange, yellow, blue, purple boxes they each stand for uh, or a mode of transport or spatial planning and when they get there they can uh, try they can get a card 
and the card says what the, it, the card shows a certain measure and they have to discuss if they want to invest in that card with their budget their their shared budget or if they leave the card out uh, so step by step they they dice for this mobility plan and that's what they're doing here and then because it's a game of course sometimes you have to end you, you land on the question mark <laughs> and the question mark always has surprises. So, you know, a public transport operator needs more subsidy or uh, civil servants are ill and the work cannot be done. So there is this tension as well. That budget goes away <laughs> all of a sudden. Yeah, so they have to try to make a balanced mobility plan. We show them the result of their choices and then they re- then uh, the participants reflect on okay what what do we take away from this game do we what kind of balance do we want to strive for fantastic interesting yeah who wins <laughs> well uh, nobody <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it it's it, the point is is you're it's creating discussion and reframing yeah. and thinking through these things uh, yeah. Is there an, is there an assumption of a, a limited budget, and so you're having to allocate it from a limited fund uh, of of uh, budgetary funds versus being able to ever expand the the pie, so to speak? Right. right. So okay. uh, yeah, we put on that limitation, and we've created like several rounds with the big measures first. You know, the very structural. Uh, measures about the network and stuff and then also zooming into the the smaller measures that cost little but can impact yeah interesting so based on those experiences of of working uh, with folks and having them do this what was the biggest surprise for you well we haven't played it very often yet because it's still difficult to convince people working uh, with it well, the interesting part is also that we have like the last round that we give them a card and they have to imagine that they're someone else. So they get a persona and they have to like reflect the mobility plan that we made that that work for this person. So we try to show them how, well, what the impact is of their choices to t- different kinds of people, because that's something that you know, talking about the Dutch context, because that's the context that I work mostly in, uh, we tend to forget, like, who do we do this for? Who do we forget? And who do we harm with our mobility plan? So that's also something that we try to incorporate. And that is also like the moment that you see people thinking like, right, I can do this differently uh, in my work. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. So when you look at the, this concept of, of the mobility donut and, uh, you know, an access to various mobility modes, really, I mean, when we, when we look at this, 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 you know, framework and it, it sounds like almost like the Goldilocks theory, we're trying to get things just right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that, that happy, medium uh, where we have just enough, where we're not excessively leaning towards one mobility mode versus the other. There's adequate access to mobility options and choice, and uh, and we're not in a situation of access poverty, mobility poverty. So wh- where do we go with this? So where do we go with this is that the mobility donut is a is a conceptual framework of course so and what we do with the game or with engaging with citizens which was the previous picture but we try to you know get them in a different narrative and the, the concept really helps to do that to make this shift talking from more or less cars to what kind of world do we want to live in but once you've made choices or or embrace the mobility donut you can take a new look at the projects that you're working on. And what this is, a, so I, I wanted to show some examples of work that's 
that we've been doing or has been going on somewhere in the world that shows that you can uh, work towards this better balance step by step. Because of yeah, what you say, it's very delicate. Like finding that balance and working on that balance and getting there, of course, is years of work and patience. So our first step is to convince people that they have to get going there and take these steps. But of course, in our daily work, we try to do several things to move forward. This is from my American colleagues working in North Carolina. And, and this was a project, Communities on the Move, it was called. And my colleagues worked with the local community to identify, well, identify measures how to get them walking. It was a health organization that subsidized this project. But it's a it's an example of like a not too big of a project, but that can create a lot of impact talking about the inside of the donut, enabling people to walk short distances in their town, making sure that they are not dependent on the car anymore and that they feel safe walking towards other places in town. Well, it's a, one could call it as a, like a small example or not the biggest impact of all, but it's interesting. These are, oh, and I know a lot of the people that watch your podcast will recognize these kind of projects, but that's already contributing to this better balance. Yeah. And yeah, when I see this image, I think about, you know, who might be existing in that mobility poverty area there where there's a lack of access. It's like, it's right over there, but we can't get there. But there's this shortcut that could exist. Let's mow down, let's mow this space here. Let's create a pathway. Let's, let's connect the, the, this community to this, this meaningful destination. Yeah, so they've, they've been, uh, and that's what I like when uh, with the results of the project were shared with me. Like the images were very strong. Like they put up all these signs, like how it could be. So this is what you see here. So it's a, it's a very low-key project, low-key measures, but it does work of finding the balance in a mobility donut. And also, again, uh, taking those people with you, like showing them how it could be. And this is from the same project, like here could be the future sidewalk, communicating to people passing by that there will be other options soon. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So now we get to this this other sort of uh, – this could actually be very much a political framing and a political decision of, you know, if we have limited funds, what do we do? Do we subsidize electric cars? Yeah. Do we subsidize electric bicycles? Yeah, so I, I thought it would – to illustrate uh, how you can work with the donut um, or use it in your discussion to put forward some dilemmas, of course, you know, there is – for both there you could say something for both options electric cars of course are a lot cleaner pollution wise but still they take up a lot of space so that transformation is not really there uh, but still it scores better on several uh, parts of the donut and it, but it costs a lot of money <laughs> to subsidize those electric cars uh, where you can also say, what can we do with this money? How many electric bicycles can we subsidize with this money? I forgot to, well, I didn't get the picture in time from my colleague, but here in the Netherlands, we've been working in uh, Utrecht. Well, we've been evaluating a project that hands out bikes to people who cannot afford, afford it. So for like only 30 euros, they get a bike and they also get like a follow-up with a with instructions on how to use the bike and how to repair it, for example. And talking about numbers, you know, the, the money that goes towards that project that helps a lot of people on a yearly basis compared to, for example, uh, implementing, how do you say, the, the poles where, people, where the electric cars can charge. Right, yeah, the charging stations, yeah. The charging stations, like the money that takes... You know, there, there's not a balance there. Of course, you can argue like how many people you help with that. and But I find that a striking example of how to allocate your money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, 
when we go into uh, building new infrastructure, transforming existing infrastructure, and we look at the example that Utrecht, um, you know, really provides for us. Uh, I've talked about this this particular example um, multiple times here on the podcast, but go ahead and frame this up. I mean, this is 1983 at this particular location there in Utrecht, and um, and this was towards the end of its lifespan in its current iteration at this time. Uh, go ahead and, uh, and set this up for, for some folks who may not uh, be familiar with this particular uh, situation. Yeah. So we're looking at um, the boundary of the, the yeah the boundaries of the city center of Utrecht, which is on the left side of the picture. Just right on the picture, just outside the frame, is uh, the central station, and this was the major road across the city center uh, in the 80s and 90s before they've uh, put up this infrastructure, made this infrastructure. Uh, there was water there. <laughs> yeah, it was a canal. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, there was a canal, you know, being the historic uh, outskirt of the uh, or well, the boundary of the city center. But yeah, we, wa- we wanted to prioritize cars. We thought that cars were the future and that we made, had to make sure that cars could get everywhere in town as soon as possible, as quick as possible. Wait a minute, um, Babette. You get a you get a pot. The Dutch? You were prioritizing yeah. cars? How dare you? Yeah. And also in these days, like in the eighties, I wasn't there yet. <laughs> but what I heard, uh, there were a lot of protests at that time already of people who are really focused on the on the you know cars being a dangerous vehicle, killing people, killing kids. So that was also at the center of our, well, at the center of the protests and the reason why we've been investing in bikes from that point on. And luckily, why a lot of plans didn't make it, also in Utrecht, like a lot of cities would have been torn up because of planned motorways. But luckily, a lot of people uh, woke up in time and plans didn't continue and weren't implemented. Uh, yeah, but that also happened to Utrecht. But the interesting thing here is that Utrecht could have stayed on that story. Like we have to prioritize cars and invest in their speed and comfort. But one day someone woke up in the city of Utrecht and was like, yeah, what kind of city do we want to be? Who do we want to make space for and give place to? And they for people who are very sharp, you will see that we're now looking at the same location from the opposite direction. Uh, so at this point, the station is on your left side and the city center is on your right side. And they reinforced it. They got the canal back. <laughs> and also for the Dutch and you know, when I go to Utrecht and take my friends, for example, who don't know the story behind this, yeah. everyone's like, wow, really bold move. <laughs> uh, but it brought so much green back. Um, and of course, Utrecht is known for the number of cyclists every day there. So they follow that. Like we have such a big group of people biking from the city center, uh, from the central station through the city center to our university to our hospital to well everywhere across town we need to cater that and uh, yeah this is this is a bold move and which is not uh, initiated i guess by mobility but by the question what kind of city do we want to be what kind of city do we want to live in and if you answer that question and then take the donut well you get to these solutions yeah and, you know, it really is a, a tremendous transformation from going from a canal to a highway uh, and then back to a canal again. And uh, to also to the left of this frame is uh, is a motorway. There's there's actually a pretty busy street. Uh, so yeah. it's not as if motor vehicles are now banned from this space. They're still allowed. Um, and that particular uh, motorway to the left is is like I said quite busy. There, there's quite a few motor vehicles uh, heading in that direction, heading towards the uh, the downtown station or the central station there. 
But uh, interestingly enough, uh, we see an expansion of mobility options. Uh, we see it now being very, very conducive to people riding bikes, uh, both on the left and on the right uh, side. And uh, a good friend of mine, he, he's now, Herz, he, he's like, yeah, now I can, I can jump in my, my boat, my kayak, and I can paddle. And so he has an enhanced mobility options of even uh, restoring that waterway as, as mobility too. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing how that how how the area has transformed and how it attracts people yeah. as well. Yeah. It, it was a joy for me to be able to watch the transformation of this location. Yeah. Um, having visited uh, uh, Utrecht uh, multiple times from from 2015 um, on, and so I was able to see it when. Uh, before the water was put back in and they were still digging and, and, and reforming everything. So really quite a joy and pleasure to, to do that. And, and I've actually stayed at, at one of the hotels right along this stretch. And so it's, it's been wonderful to, to really experience that. So the yeah. additional thing that, that, that we have here is what does this signify to <laughs> you? I mean, I know what I think of, I I'm like, yes. Mechanical <laughs> bollards, but uh, well, what are we looking at here from a mobility yeah, we're looking perspective? At two uh, pollards uh, blocking the road for cars so that cars cannot move through the neighborhood directly and have to redirect their route, uh, which makes their trip a bit longer, a bit slower. And uh, it maybe helps that they choose the bike next time. Right. So, so this, would be what to- we, this is what we would call a modal, modal filter. In the sense that, uh, you know, there's permeability for walking and biking. But I also noticed that this looks like they are controlled mechanically or or electronically. They'll they'll lower down. So if somebody is is needing access, like it looks like those cars that are on the other side, uh, maybe there is that ability to uh, to flow through this area if you had the appropriate access. Yeah, or for like uh, ambulances, fire. And, and for ambulances and fire. Yeah. yeah. Um, the reason why I wanted to show this is because we are talking a lot about, you know, big cities or at least the Dutch big cities are providing us with major examples. Uh, but these are measures that are implemented in towns, tiny towns <laughs> as well. Uh, so, you know, because that's also one of the Uh, remarks that we get a lot is that we talk about cities and urban areas but this is it can be this is very much applied or relevant in in smaller towns as well and it's not as big as the previous example but talking about building new infrastructure or transforming your current infrastructure uh, this one is striking again because what i come across a lot is that more rural towns argue that they need an extra route around the town because it's super busy inside inside in the town center and it's unsafe uh, because of the cars going through so they argue that they need this extra route going around town and i always get a bit annoyed (laughs) when i hear that Because you can spend your money wiser than that. It costs millions to build new asphalt, uh, new tarmac. And the question, again, is what kind of city, what kind of town do you want to live in? Because everyone wants to live in a green area where people are on the streets, where we can see each other, meet each other. That's most most people will answer that. Of course, they want a safe space to live in. But... To get there, to get to this safe green area, you can also talk about, you know, slowing down the central route in your town and trying to encourage people to use active modes within town and only get the cars when they really need to go far away. Um, And then these kind of measures can, you know, uh, help and transform that rather than this big new road that also causes barriers for people walking, people cycling. And yeah, so that's why I put this one in. Yeah, I love it. It's great. And uh, it also exemplifies too, uh, you know, 
the detail of of the materials that you use when you're using, you know, the brick uh, in this type of area that's signifying that this is a slow speed area. And uh, again, automobility is a possibility. You're able to get to that your destination to be able to park here, but it sends a different message as to uh, yes, there's the access, but the the environment that's being created is a slow speed environment. So, yeah, good stuff. Excellent. Next one. Yeah. Do you recognize it? I don't. <laughs> I was curious if you were already aware of this uh, this project. This yeah. is in Amsterdam. It's called the Weesperstraat, and it's a pilot to close off the Weesperstraat, which is a major route inside Amsterdam. Again, this is a bold move. They implemented a pilot for, I think, six weeks. And what they wanted to do is to, you know, measure what how it affected uh, routes, car routes, and also what it did to the neighborhood. Only ambulances and firefighters and stuff, they were allowed to pass. And it caused a lot of fuss in Amsterdam, but also in the national new paper, newspapers. They are currently working on the evaluation. So... I cannot say anything about that, but I, again, wanted to illustrate it because thinking with the donut in mind, how to work towards this better balance, do we want to invest in, well, enabling cars to go faster, quicker, get easier to their destination and cause a lot of excessive mobility? Or do we want to invest in people walking, cycling, do we want to invest in the quality of the neighborhood, of the livability? And um, yeah, what is the result of that? Uh, so that I, I'm super curious of how, they, how the evalu evaluation will be, what the story will be, and how they will continue this or won't. But that's, again, a new way of uh, looking towards your infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, to your point and uh, in, in, in what we were framing is, are we building new infrastructure or are we transforming existing infrastructure? This is an example of, you know, hey, let's be bold. Let's try to transform our existing infrastructure into something that more closely aligns with what our values are. Uh, from from and this is where you you talk about you know the policy side of things is like okay what do we uh, you know believe in and what are our values from uh, from a political uh, you know perspective and uh, and, and again you know th these decisions that are doing these are dichotomous sometimes decisions do we expand street parking or do we transform into a more livable you know, street. And, and that brings us back to the photo of, you know, the play street is it probably was street parking at one point in time. Now it's a more livable street. Yeah. And I, this is also one I come across like almost on a daily basis in projects where our clients or like governments, uh, municipalities say like there's this neighborhood and they're complaining very much about on street parking, there is not enough space for them, etc. How are you answering that noise <laughs> sound uh, from citizens? Are you are you automatically catering for it uh, and expanding it like this? For, uh, this is a shopping street, even, but or is this a moment where you say, "Well, let's keep them to their uh, parking problems; they have to deal with it." Maybe that will be like a, a incentive for them to uh, change behavior. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and parking is an interesting and, it, and when you think about, you know, do what is it's it really comes down to the definition. Um, one of my taglines for the channel is streets are for people. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, streets have literally been around for thousands of years. The automobile really came on the scene about 120 years ago. And so when we, when we really stop and think about, well, what are streets for? And so, well, streets are for people. And, and sometimes people get lost, you know, when, when cars are present, because then it just seems like, oh, streets are for machines and these big, you know, polluting, dangerous things. But then when you 
when you see a stark transformation or you see a pivot and say, or, and you see, you know, a street that's occupied primarily by cars and then pair that with a street where people are at and you're like, oh, okay, that's right. Yeah. There's a difference. Right. And um, we're now looking at photos from uh, Batumi, Georgia, where we've been working on a school zone project. And well, yeah, what the remarks that you give are on point, of course. How can we transform a school zone area as a place where, where only cars stop <laughs> while there are kids going to school, right? So with like measures on the street real time, my colleagues uh, implemented this this cool street and it provided a, a completely different street. And this is also a discussion that we come across everywhere in every in, in every city that around the world it's well in a lot of work that we do yeah, yeah. if they if the cars have sort of taken over the environment which in most places in the world they have <laughs> we we have this this crazy situation where uh cars are invading the school zones and so this push to try to pull back the automobility, uh, you know, in the school zones is I think so incredibly helpful. It gets to the wellness th stuff that you were talking about. It gets to human vitality. Uh, you know, kids should be able to walk and bike to the schools and the area around a school zone should not be a dangerous area, right. dangerous space. Right. So, um, yeah, I found this a, a good example again of, talking about the right balance. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. And it brings us back into what, you know, some of these big, big decisions of, you know, are we investing in public transit? Are we investing in highways? If there's limited sums of money, limited budget available, maybe it's not possible to do both. Yeah. Yeah, this is a known discussion for a lot of your watchers, I would say, for a lot of your, a big part of your public. It's in the U.S. It's a discussion in the Netherlands. And I find that, again, very striking of how we, we give so much weight and importance to our highways, uh, while there is only a small, smaller fraction of our people using them. And the problems that they that we experience on the problems that we experience on highways are experienced by people who are very capable of moving around because of their private car and they can get anywhere and then the people who probably need the public transport they rely on public transport that's something that we in the Netherlands at least slight step by step public transport disappears or is focusing on on the routes that are very busy and um, so that's interesting as well like how how can you explain that <laughs> yeah 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 well and it's it, even just taking your commute as as an example you know getting from Nijmegen on all the way up to Zwolle I mean you're it's a, a one hour public transit ride for you to get up there uh yeah. there are highways you can totally drive if you wanted yeah. to um, I'm not sure if it would be a sim similar amount of time or not, but I guarantee you it would not be as anywhere near as pleasant um, or, you know, the ability for you to, to, to use that time in other ways, whether it's you know, reading or doing some work or catching a nap yeah. or whatever, um, that, you know, those are the, the challenges, you know, that, that we have in front of us. And again, um, I appreciate the fact that you you started us off by saying, really, you're not focused on building the infrastructure. You're you're really focused on that policy side and the political side of having those discussions with city leaders and other uh, individuals of, hey, what kind of community do you want? 
And again, um, you, you are with Mobicon. Uh, again, we're, we're seeing uh, Mobicon doing some wonderful things, even here in North America now. Uh, thank you so much for, for doing that. Uh, Zach Vanderkoy from, from uh, Boulder is, is a good friend of mine, and, and I've had him on the channel before and uh, look forward to seeing more of the Mobiconites <laughs> here in North America. Uh, any final words that you'd like to, to, to mention? about either the Mobility Donut or MobiCon in general or your work? Well, I hope that, you know, the message came across of what the Mobility Donut uh, means and it, what it means to me personally, maybe, <laughs> but also what it can mean in, in your and mine uh, work. Um, and I'm very up for discussion. <laughs> so... Yeah, I'm very curious what the response will be and what the thoughts of people listening to this podcast uh, will be. Um, and yeah, I really hope and I think that's something wonderful about working in this field is how we encourage each other again and again to keep doing good work. So um, working on streets like this. Yeah, working on streets like this, and for the listening audience, we're actually looking at that that uh, living street, the play street, once again, and uh, and, and yeah, there's layers to it. Um, we're, we're we're looking to see some streets that are are like living streets and play streets, but we're also looking at the reality of. Yeah, I mean, we also need to be able to get people around on public transit. So uh, again, for the listening audience, we've got the photo on screen here that has the bus stop and the, the bikes uh, rolling by. And it looks like there is a bus lane and it looks like there's also uh, automobile traffic versus what we see far too often here in North America and around the globe is a strode, is an auto sewer where everything is just all about one mode of traffic and uh one mode of mobility. We want to see a little bit more balanced approach uh, and, and balanced in such a way that it is reflective of what our true visions are and aspirations are for a prosperous, uh, creating a prosperous and healthy and well society. I bet. It's That's been great. such a pleasure. Thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Babette. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts through Patreon, uh, buy me a coffee, uh, YouTube, super thanks right down below. Just click on that button right down there, as well as making donations to the nonprofit and buying things from the Active Town store. I've got some sweets are for people, swag out there, t-shirts, water bottles, coffee mugs, all sorts of good stuff. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.